Good afternoon. Almost showtime. Thanks for joining me again as we talk, as we continue our series of lectures for you, the workers' compensation professional. Today, we're going to talk about the Orthopedic Roadshow. And basically, this is a, a cursory talk to get you through all the nuances of the medical terminology and directions and other clinical bond mods you can take away from x-ray reports and MRI reports and other clinical documentations. The only way to know where you're going is with a map. Therefore, we have the Orthopedic Roadshow. So where do we begin? We know there's no map to human behavior. I was doing a file just this morning and started out with a shoulder injury, which became a back injury, which became a neck injury, which became a middle finger injury. I bring that up because in our services that we provide, one of those is pre-authorization. And one of my physicians was doing a report and sent me over the documentation. The request was for massage therapy for a sprain of the middle finger. Now, I can remember massage therapy for a sprain of the middle finger when my grandfather asked me to pull his finger. And we know about that joke. So we know there's no map to human behavior, particularly when it comes to workers' compensation. I had to get a map to see where the pathology was. This talk is gonna help you understand exactly what we're talking about, where we're talking about it, because that will direct the type of care that is appropriate for that particular injury. So this is where we begin. This is the famous Da Vinci drawing of man. And by convention, we had to establish basic ground rules so that when clinical professionals are talking, we all know what we're talking about and we can provide to you those different services or those different treatments relative to the specific body part. So we start from this basic premise. Let's talk about the upper extremities of the upper arm. And obviously this is the right upper extremity with all the muscle, the skin is removed obviously, and here are the muscles. Now, right here, we have the deltoid, big, wide muscle, and should be intact. I would tell you that for all of you all, I would hope that there is a small little tiny pinprick right here where you got your COVID vaccinations. Not to be too much of a public service announcement here, but I would urge you all to get your COVID vaccinations. I know there are some people who have some issues with that from a political perspective, and I completely understand that. From a clinical perspective, the literature is there and you're only going to do yourself a service by getting that vaccination and enough of my political ranting. So we have the deltoid here and the posterior aspect of the arm is the triceps and we'll show you why it's called triceps in a little bit. And then the anterior aspect is the biceps. And I use those terms anterior or posterior because we're gonna talk about them later on in this talk so you get a sense of what's going on. And of course, here are the musculature about the elbow the brachialis, and of course, the distal aspect where the extensor digitorum musculature occurs and the extensor muscle, muscle are through here, which creates all the activity in the hand. As you can see down towards the bottom, here are the tendons. So when you make a fist down here at the bottom, it is not the muscles in the hand that are working, it's the muscles in the forearm that are working. And that comes into play when we're talking about complex hand injuries and other issues such as carpal tunnel, which we'll talk about later. Quickly, let's talk about the bones of the upper extremity. And this is important because we have the clavicle, also known as the collarbone, and the scapula, also known as the shoulder blade. But we have here the shoulder we'll talk about in a moment, but we need to know that this is a very complex articulation and a lot of things can go wrong. In the upper extremity, we have the humerus. And then in the forearm, it's two bones called the ulna over here and the radius. And the radius is the one below your thumb, that's where all the motion comes. So when you pronate or supinate, that is move your hand, palm down or palm up, it's the radius that's moving, not so much the ulna. And then distally, we have the carpals, metacarpals, and the phalanges. And I like saying the word phalanges, it's just a fun, pleasant little word that I use as much as I possibly can. So let's talk about the shoulder. We have the glenohumeral joint. The glenohumeral joint is a ball and socket type of joint. And we're gonna see that again in the lower extremity in a moment. This is also known as a basketball in a teacup relative to its instability. Inherently, 
this joint is unstable. There are a number of muscles and tendons that maintain its stability, but it's easily compromised given the physics of the upper extremity. We have the humerus, which is the long bone in the upper extremity, which we pointed out a moment ago, and it ends in the funny bone. And for those of you who have struck your funny bone, you know there's nothing funny about it. And basically that's a contusion to the ulnar nerve at the backside of the elbow, which causes that numbness feeling. And it really is pretty uncomfortable. Fortunately, I haven't done that in probably 20 or 30 years, but my memory is still pretty sharp when I whack that little area. Let's talk about more bones of the shoulder. I wanted to really point this out. So we have, this is a posterior aspect. So here is the scapula, AKA the shoulder blade. Over front here, you can see the clavicle, also known as the collarbone. And here's a ligament here, the acromioclavicular ligament. You get a sense of how thick this ligament is relative to these two bones because it holds the shoulder together and it gets compromised. And right through here is the acromion, which is part of the scapula, but it's a separate part. I wanted to point out that there are congenital variants to the acromion. You probably read them as a type two or a type three acromion, which means that this horizontal bone angles downward or towards the top of the humerus, okay? When you look right through here and you see that there's very little space, and this is where the rotator cuff is, and we'll talk about that in a moment, then this loss of space compromises the tendons of the rotator cuff causing an impingement or also known as impingement syndrome. A key point to remember is that 45% of the population over 40 has compromised the rotator cuff. If you think about it, every time you move your arm, you elevate your shoulder, you throw a pitch, you cut a stake, whatever you do, you're moving this humerus and the articulates up against here, the chromioclavicular joint, the glomerulohumeral joint, and it irritates and compromises all those soft tissues. Bone is hard, soft tissues are soft for a reason, and with constant irritation, and it be a, a micron or something really, really tiny, but cumulatively, it wears out that joint. And that's why you have such a significant portion, 45% of the population, as I mentioned, having changes to the rotator cuff. And back here, because of this whole articulation, you have the acromioclavicular ligament covering up the acromioclavicular joint, the AC joint. And that gets compromised easily as well. To the point where every shoulder injury that you receive, it would be my suggestion that you look at the x-ray report. And if there is any hint of arthritis or degenerative changes, osteophytosis or anything like that, you can test the acromioclavicular joint arthritis as not being a function of the compensable event. Two reasons for that. One, it will limit, if this goes to a rotator cuff surgery, it will limit the AC joint procedure that will be part of that because the orthopedic surgeon is gonna see that, he's gonna burn it down, that's what he's supposed to do. Secondly, a little bit of irritation in here, and, and if you do, and I'll show you in a later slide, a distal clavicle excision, that adds 10% upper extremity or six points whole person to the final impairment rating. So if you get a range of motion loss because the rotator cuff lesion or the surgery, add six points because of that little birthing, and then you're staring at a SIBS level impairment rating when you really don't need to because you're not addressing the sequelae of the identified incident. So it would be my suggestion to you that whatever you can, look at the AC joint and exclude that, file the PN11 and exclude that from the compensable injury. Here is an interview of the shoulder, a little more blown up. As you can see right here, here's the glenoid and here's the humeral head. Big humeral head, big round thing, little tiny glenoid. This is what we mean by basketball and a teacup. As you can see over here, again, inherently not a very stable joint when we compare it to the hip as we'll see in a few minutes, but this is it. And there's a lot of ligaments and tendons and of course the rotator cuff that comes on and attaches this bone to the shoulder. So with, with the exception of the, which we don't see here, a lot of the soft tissues, okay, that would just not play with me. Um, with, this, with, with the exception of the soft tissues here, that holds the arm onto the body. And with all the motions it goes through, all the irritations that it goes through, they wear out. So be very careful when you're accepting a shoulder injury. Look at the mechanism of injury. He had a fall onto his shoulder 
And if the MRI or the X-ray report doesn't identify any acute pathology, and in the face of osteophytosis, osteophyte formation, a chromial clavicular joint degenerative changes, all that, understand that a majority of this pathology existed prior to the injury. I'm not saying you can't get an acute shoulder dislocation. You obviously can. You can get a, an acute rotator cuff tear. That can happen as well. But there are going to be specific findings on MRI that will tell you if they are acute or not. And given the propensity for this joint to wear out, be careful you're not paying for degenerative changes. Let's move on down to the elbow. The elbow is known as a hinge joint. It involves the distal end of the humerus and the proximal end of the radius and ulna. And here are the bones. As we can see here, here's a humerus, here's a distal end. We got some knobs here at the end. This one's called the medial epicondylitis, medial epicondyle, I misspoke, I'm sorry. And here's the capitellum. Guess what happens here with the medial epicondyle? You get a medial epicondylitis because the soft tissues attach here and they become inflamed. On the lateral aspect, you can have that as well. And that's called a lateral epicondylitis. But again, this joint has not a lot of motion, not a lot of uh, space between them. And basically this is a flexion joint. The elbow primarily moves in one direction. When you get a rotation, it's down lower. It's not at the elbow. It's at the lower bones that pronate and supinate. And we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. But uh, this is where it, where it all occurs. And again, a very common injury is a radial head fracture. You get an impact in this injury, this chunk, moves against this chunk, and you can get a fracture right through here. Very common injury, happens to a lot of us, happened to me, and uh, we're having it right now. So we, we're going on with that. I just want to make you aware of the, the type of bones there are and the space you have there. Muscles of the elbow, again, here we have the anterior aspect and it's the biceps. Notice how this muscle belly divides into two separate tendons. And this is called this is the reason why it's called a biceps muscle. Okay, you've got, and they're both called biceps tendons. Additionally, down at the bottom, you've got, an, it's also called the biceps tendon. And this is why you need to know the direction and the location of the lesion. I bring that up because if there's a tear of the biceps tendon up here, you don't treat it surgically. However, if there's a tear of the biceps tendon distally, and they're both called biceps tendon, which just adds the confusion, this is a surgical urgency, not an emergency, but you need to treat this within three weeks because if this is torn, this muscle will retract and all of a sudden you've got a Popeye deformity and you got a big bulging muscle here that's not doing its job to the elbow. There will be some people who try to attach it somewhere along here. It's never a good outcome. So if you see, and normally it's a 35, 45, 50 year old guy who picks up something and he has a sudden pop in his arm, and a Popeye deformity here, it's a tear of the distal biceps tendon and that requires surgical intervention. Again, uh, here we have the triceps tendon, but I just wanna give you a different uh, perspective on the biceps muscle, how it goes forward. Earlier, we talked about medial and lateral epicondylitis. If it's on the medial aspect, it's golfer's elbow, on the lateral aspect, it's tennis elbow, and I'm sure whoever came up with those topics lost a bet at their golf club or whatever. Uh, but uh, we have the ulnar collateral ligament. Again, this is a ligament between the ulna and the, the capitellum right here and other ligament structures. To be clear, ligaments compromise, I'm sorry, ligaments attach bone to bones, okay? Whereas tendons attach muscle to bones. And that's important when we talk about sprains versus strains. A sprain means that this ligament is torn and they're compromised either first degree, second degree, or third degree. Sometimes they just get inflamed, a medial epicondylitis, or an interstitial tear that right in the middle is a few fibers of this pop. If you think of the ligament as a rope and you pop a few fibers in the rope before the rope completely dissolves, that's what we call an interstitial tear, a, a first degree tear or an inflammation. These are treated a lot easier. Uh, first degrees, immobilization, non-steroidals, things like that, doesn't require surgery. However, if it becomes chronic and doesn't resolve, it may require some surgical intervention. 
but this is a medial view and it's called a medial epicondylitis or Goffer's elbow. Now, of course, we have the tennis elbow on the other side. Here's a lateral aspect of the elbow and you can see where the brachialis becomes a tendon. Here are the muscle and basically around every muscle, there is a fibrous sheath and it's kind of like an envelope and where the sheath ends and it becomes one, that's where it becomes a tendon. So right here, you can see all the fibrous sheath becoming a tendon and the tendon attaches to the lateral aspect of the elbow. So you have, if this becomes inflamed or irritated because of motion or whatever, then this is what's called a lateral epicondylitis. And again, the treatment is rather straightforward. You start with non-steroidals, perhaps a steroid injection. And if it's really reticent to uh, treatment and this continues to be markedly symptomatic and there are findings of physical examination, surgical intervention is a possibility. But again, all three of those criteria have to be met before you go with that direction. But I just wanted to give you a sense of, here's the medial epicondylitis, here's the lateral epicondylitis. These are the things that we're talking about. Then we have the wrist, and the wrist is known as a pivot joint. It involves the distal aspect of the ulnar radius, those same two muscle bones we were talking about a moment ago in the elbow, and the carpal bones. So we have the muscles of the wrist and the wrist and hand are very complex structures. This is what separates us from everybody else in the animal kingdom. Okay, we have a huge number of muscles requiring different functions. We have, and this one on the left here, you can see the red is the blood circulation, the yellow is the nerve interventions throughout the hand. Very complex clinical situation, but the hand does so much you know, being immobilized secondary to my fracture, you realize how much you, even the non-dominant hand, you need for everyday living, okay? Um, so as we can see here, lots of uh, tendons, lots of uh, nerve fibers, lots of uh, 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 circulation, capillary arteries, and things like that. What I wanted to point out here is this structure right here. On the Palmer view or the volar aspect, this is the carpal ligament. And this is a ligament that kind of keeps all these tendons in place. As I mentioned earlier, when you go to make a fist or bend your fingers down, it's the muscles in the forearm that are working. So if you made a fist right now, and you can see in your forearm, those are the muscles that are contracting. Those are the muscles pulling the tendons through and bringing the fingers down into a fist. There is a little bit of functionality with the lumbrical muscles here, but these muscles don't do it nearly as much as the bigger ones in the form in terms of controlling your fist. When this ligament becomes chronically inflamed, it becomes thickened. Inflamed in response is scar tissue. So instead of having a two millimeter thick structure, it becomes four, six, eight, get depending on the severity. So when this structure becomes thickened, it compromises all of these tendons and structures here. Look at the drawing and here you can see this really thin little line. And this is the flexor retinaculum, also known as the carpal ligament. Underneath the carpal ligament, a number of tendons. And these are depicted with the little white ovals here. And of course, there is the a nerve right there. And that's the median nerve that correlates with this structure right here. So if this retinaculum becomes thick, then the space between the retinaculum and the bone obviously gets decreased. And when the space gets decreased, the blood flow, notice these two little red spots, those are the arteries, and the nerve function is compromised. Imagine trying to uh, put 100 gallons of water through a one inch spigot. The same thing, things back up. Well, in this case, the nerve impulses back up and are not functional. So that what happens, you get pain. And that pain becomes carpal tunnel syndrome. At one point, it was the bane of the existence of the workers' comp world. Fortunately, because of newer, newer findings in, in the literature, we know that most carpal tunnel syndrome situations are not occupational events. Again, we talked about this becoming thickened, the structure right here. That does not occur because somebody did a half an hour of typing this morning on a new computer, okay? Or it used to be when it would throw the quarters into the box at the toll takers. No, it doesn't happen that way. The literature is rife with a number of citations indicating that this does not occur occupationally and it doesn't occur at a one-time event. 
So if somebody is alleging carpal tunnel syndrome, you really need to get a very detailed history and when this occurred. And if it's one, one time event, oh, they took me off from my job and they put me on this other job and I had to cut a use of scissors. And after two hours, I had wrist pain. I've got carpal tunnel. That is simply not true. Okay. So we have all that. I just want to point it out to you relative to what is carpal tunnel syndrome. Then we have the bones of the wrist. And here are the, there's seven different bones in the wrist. And you can tell they're not any kind of regular shape. They're curved. They're, uh, they, they're the shape defies description. But again, we have ligaments that attach at different points as, as noted by the red here and different ligaments are between all of these bones. So as I'll show you in a minute about the different structures, but I wanna point out this one here, this is called the scaphoid. And this is a curved shape bone, kind of like a comma. And oftentimes you get an injury right through here and you can't tell. It does not show up on x-ray for several weeks at a time. So if somebody has wrist pain and make a note of it, if the pain is in the anatomic snuff box, and there's a whole story behind that, but that's what we call it. If, there's, if you put a thumb in an anatomic snuff box and that patient says, ow, you treat them as if they have a scaphoid fracture and you have to wait for several weeks before the x-rays can prove or not prove that there was a scaphoid fracture. But I just wanted you to get a sense of how difficult it is to uh, imagine all these different bones and the shapes and how you can, and there's a million ways to hurt them, uh, but that's going through, but this is just some of the difficulties. Here's a cutaway view of the wrist that we talked about earlier. Again, I wanted to reemphasize, here's that flexor retinaculum or the, the carpal ligament right through here. Here are all the tendons and here's the median nerve. You've got a little bit of a space here, okay? Not that much. If this ligament gets thickened, the space gets decreased, this nerve gets compressed and you get a difficulty with the nerve impulses going from the digits through this nerve, through the spinal cord, up to your brain to tell you whatever is happening. And again, here's the median nerve, okay? But one thing I wanna point out here, this nerve innervates the thumb, the index and the middle finger and a little bit of the ring finger. If somebody says my whole hand is hurting, then it's not a median nerve issue because the median nerve doesn't do that other aspect of the fourth finger or the entirety of the fifth digit. So that's a way of knowing, okay, not my injury, where are we going from that? And again, again, here's one with the flexor retinaculum showing the innervation and things like that. This next slide, again, identifies the carpal tunnel syndrome. See how this is thickened over here? And this is compressing that median nerve, showing that this is not a happy, happy nerve. And again, the nerve is irritated distally as shown here in red. But this next document, here is a severe carpal tunnel syndrome. This is an older gentleman who has severe wasting of the thenar musculature. And you can see, if you looked at your hand right about here, you see a nice soft, mushy lump. And over here, it's similar, it's gone. This guy has a severe carpal tunnel syndrome and surgery probably is not gonna make this better. But this is what could happen and you lose the functionality and the pain and everything else of it. And I just wanted, this is the most dramatic uh, documentation of carpal tunnel syndrome I came across. I just wanted to show you that. If you see a diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome, make sure it's truly there. And also make sure that it, the mechanism of injury corresponds to what this person was doing. The clinical indications for carpal tunnel most often occur, and ladies, please don't hit me for this, but this is the statistics, women. And if you're overweight and you consume tobacco, then you have a much higher incidence of carpal tunnel syndrome. In fact, uh, I can remember during my rotation in, in uh, obstetrics a million years ago, that pregnancy leads to increased fluid retention and that fluid would collect in this space and you would get a pregnancy related carpal tunnel syndrome. When the pregnancy went away, the carpal tunnel syndrome away, everybody's happy, but it can occur. It just shows you how it doesn't take much to really compromise that median nerve. Additionally, with the advent of MRI studies and with arthroscopy, which has only been around for 30 years, which is funny for me to say because that's within my clinical lifetime, that we identified that the triangular fiber cartilage complex, all these little 
ligaments down through here, they can become torn, not heal, and all of a sudden these bones, which are closely articulated right through here, start to move, and you can get symptomology. And that if that doesn't resolve with conservative care, immobilization, non-steroidal, steroid injections, again, this may require arthroscopic surgery as well. But I wanted to give you a sense of what, when we're talking about a TFCC lesion, this is what we're talking about, all these tiny little structures down here. That was the upper extremity. Let's go to the lower extremity. And of course, we start with the hip, also known as a ball and socket joint. Then we have the knee, a hinge joint, just like the elbow, and the ankle, which is a gliding kind of joint. It's a little bit different than the wrist. The structures are have some similarities, but have some serious differences because of their, of, of their functionality. And then we have the foot, the toes, and more phalanges. Let's look at the hip. The hip involves the acetabulum, which is the part of the pelvis, and the head of the femur, okay? So if we look at the whole pelvis, okay, here's the pelvic ring. You can feel that in your back. And then here's the, the front part is, is the ischial ring. Look how this head of the femur sits way into this socket, okay? This is a very stable joint. So that's what a ball and socket joint looks like. If you remember going back to the shoulder, the socket is one iota of this particular socket and it doesn't, that's why it's a particularly unstable joint. This is not to say you cannot dislocate this joint, you can, but it takes an awful lot of energy, i.e. a major car accident or a fall from height or whatever to dislocate that. But we have different aspects of the femur. So we have the head of the femur here, this little round stuff. This is the neck of the femur right through here. As you can see, it's the neck. And then we've got different parts of the trochanter and how thick this is. I bring that up because different hip fractures are at different locations. So if you had a fracture of the neck of the femur right through here, you treat that differently than a subtrochanteric fracture down here. And that's why we bring that up. So we're talking, when you're reading the operative note or reading before that, the, the x-ray report, then you know exactly what part of the anatomy we're talking about and what is the most appropriate treatment. There are some hip fractures that do well, but leaving them alone. Some fractures require a pinning. That is, it will take a little, surgically insert a pin right through here, up into the head, stabilize the fracture, and it does well. Other fractures require total hip replacement arthroplasty. Be very careful because if it does go to total hip replacement arthroplasty, you're staring at a 20% impairment rating. Now, what happens if, the, if it's an older individual and they have severe degenerative changes, it may go to total hip, but are they doing the total hip to address the fracture or address the arthritis? That's where it gets a little bit confusing and you should talk to your orthopedic consult, consultation provider to explain to you, does this surgery match up with the injury sustained? And get an orthopedist to tell you yes or no. And that's gonna really modify how you approach the case. I just wanna point out, you can. this is what we call a fracture of the neck. Look right through here. And you can see this very sharp edge, this huge angulation, instead of being at a 40 degree angle, this is like 90 degrees. This is an acute fracture of the hip. This is a major boo-boo. And when you look at the, the pelvis, this is not a very old individual. And boy, howdy, that's a bad news injury. That's a major boo-boo, uh, depending on this, this is one of the fractures that could require a total hip arthroplasty. But I just wanna give you a sense of the pathology. When you look at the x-ray report, they should describe not only the fracture, but the arthritic changes. There's really, I mean, a, a scotia of sclerosis here, the humeral head, I'm sorry, the femoral head, look how clean and sharp that margin is. There's no arthritis here. So if it wasn't this severe a fracture, or this location of fracture, you could treat that with some pinning and do well. In this particular case, it would go to uh, total hip. But again, the radiologist should talk about this joint, the humeral head, and all aspects of the femur before it's so you know exactly what treatment is gonna be pursued relative to this. Because the leg is held onto the body at the hip, and we have that ball and socket joint, which limits it. There are, there are a number of ligaments 
used to design to hold that leg onto the hip. And as you can see, the whole joint is circumvented with a number of very thick, tenacious ligaments. And from this drawing, you get a sense of all the striae. Again, this is like a very thick rope. And ligaments are ropey and multiple structures in, in nature so that before you accept a diagnosis of a sprain, which means these ligaments are compromised, you should be very sure that there are an injury to the hip because the treatment is different between a sprain and a strain. And we'll talk about that more in a few minutes. But again, I just want to demonstrate to you how intense the body thinks about the hip and how much it protects it with all these different ligaments. Having said that, you can dislocate your hip. Again, look at this drawing right here. This is a, the socket right here. And what's not in the socket? Oh, yeah, the head of the humerus. Okay. I'm sorry, the head of the femur. I misspoke. I apologize. So this femur should be sitting over here. It's not. Car accident or some trauma ruptured all those ligaments that were through here. They're all gone. They're all torn. See you later. There's no way. Oh, I hit the wrong button again. I'm sorry. There is no way that this head of the femur goes this far out without tearing all those ligaments I just pointed out to you, okay? So this is a relatively young individual with a relatively stable and un unaffected hip that I would guess is in, was in a car accident or some major trauma like that that forced a dislocation of the hip. And because we talk about total hip replacement orthoplasty frequently, and it is a very common surgery it does a lot of work. It's been around. It's one of the first, uh, probably the second total joint procedure I did. My first one was a total knee, and I did a total hip. But you look at it, what they do is, here's the acetabulum, and the procedure is they haul, haul that out, scrape out all the degenerative changes, and then they cut off the head of the femur right through here. And they have a variety of different shapes and styles of a femoral replacement depending on the company they use and the preferences of the orthopedic surgeon, as well as the pathology noted. But as you can see, they, they drill a pretty deep hole down the femur. They stick in this um, hard, this is titanium, you know, one of the hardest steels around, goes down here. This white area here, they fill up that with methyl methacrylate or bone cement. And uh, I'll tell you a cute story. Uh, we would take advantage of any new student in the operating theater who came in for the surgery. Methyl methacrylate comes as a powder and with a special solution. And when you're ready to use it, you mix the two together and it becomes a paste. And you squirt that paste down into that hole. But before it becomes hard, there's an exothermic reaction. The paste goes to about 270 degrees. And what we would do is, because we're mean, nasty people, we would ask that nursing student or, or, or PA student or medical student, here, hold on to this and tell us when it gets hard. And of course, they're nervous. They're, they don't want to disappoint us. So they're holding on to it. They're playing with it. Before it gets hard, it gets wickedly hot. And we watch them and see how long it takes them to, to throw it away because they're burning their hands. You know, when I say it that way, it's not as funny as it was when we were in the operating theater, but that's how we play in the OR. But here is a well-cemented, well-positioned uh, total hip. And you can see, you know, it, there's no margins here. The neck, okay, they took the bone right down through here. And this part goes right into the hip. And you don't see any space here because the cement's there and it's radio-opaque. And it en ends right here. So this is a very well-positioned, stable total hip replacement, which allows you to function really, really well. I've got golfing buddies who had total hips, and that hip took away their uh, pain, and they're playing golf, and it, it can really do that well with that. I just wanted to give you a sense of what that looks like. And let's talk about the knee. The knee includes the distal femur, the proximal tibia and fibula, as well as the intraarticular components, the medial lateral meniscus, the anterior cruciate ligament, and the posterior cruciate ligament. And here it is. So again, similar to the humerus, we see these two knobby ends to the femur. And of course, this white area is a chondral surface. Here's the tibial plateau, and this is where all the weight bearing, think about all the weight that comes down the femur and it gets translated through the knee into the tibial plateau. Because we've got two bony structures here, the body has created two shock absorbers, also known as the meniscus. And we have 
the medial, this is the medial meniscus on this side, and here's the lateral meniscus. And these are rubbery, tough structures that, again, act as shock absorbers. And I'm going to date myself here, and I hope some of you get to this joke, but if you remember Saturday Night Live, Saturday Night Live and Rosanna, Rosanna Dana, when she was talking about, you know, when you're eating that chicken and you get that little chewy piece, you don't know what to do with, yada, yada, yada. That's the meniscus. Even chickens have menisci, okay? They're there to protect both aspects of the knee and they can get torn. We've all heard about meniscal tears. If you look at this structure here, you see this tear, okay? And you've got this little hook here. This is called a parrot beak hook meniscal tear. This would require arthroscopic intervention. I would tell you that when I first started practice, the common thinking was that we had to remove the entire meniscus. And at that time, we believed there was no blood flow, that therefore the whole thing had to uh, be removed. Over time, we've learned now, we do better if we just nibble out. We've got little devices that can nibble out this part of the meniscal lesion and it goes away and people do well. But they never do as well as you'd hope, but you, you know, once you ruin original equipment, it goes south. Here are two very tough ligaments. This is the anterior cruciate ligament and behind it, the posterior cruciate ligament. This anterior one aids in the stability of the knee. As you can see, it attaches to the posterior aspect of the femur and attaches to the anterior aspect of the tibia. So this prevents your knee from sliding forward. In fact, when we're doing a knee examination, one of the tests we do is called an anterior draw sign. And what we do is we grab the leg down here and we pull on it. If it slides forward to you, you see a change in the curvature of the knee. And if it's positive, it's called an anterior draw sign telling us that this ligament has been torn. And in most cases that requires surgical intervention. And there's a number of different surgeries you can do uh, to, to address that. And they're mostly successful. Uh, we've seen pro athletes, uh, Chacon Barkley going, he's running back for the New York Giants, tore his ACL last year, and he's back on the field this year. Whoa. Now we know if it's a workers' comp case, he would be out for the next two or three years, but that's a whole separate conversation. But here's the anterior crucial ligament, here's the posterior crucial ligament, and usually when these are torn, they do require surgical intervention. That being said, I know of people who do well without theirs. They're just very cautious, they wear a knee brace, and they get fine without their anterior crucial ligament. We all know about knee arthroscopy. And I just wanted to put this one drawing in here. So here's a little device. This is a probe. As you can see, it's popped through the soft tissues here. Here's the chondral surface of the uh, distal femur. Look at this red spot here. And I, I don't know if you can get a sense how deep it is, that erosion, but that's a chondral surface erosion. This is a guy who has arthritis. And I'm here to tell you, this is going to get worse. It is simply a function of time. If you look at the literature, people who've had knee arthroscopies have a much higher incidence of arthritis in the future. So going forward, if somebody had a knee arthroscopy and 15 years later they show up on your door, I need a total knee because of my arthritis, there's a very good possibility that it's part of the compensable injury and you're going to be responsible for paying that total knee. But I just wanted to give you a sense of what it looks like when the orthopedist takes you to the OR and puts these little devices in the knee. They fill this thing. There's a lot of fluid in this knee, which you can't tell. But this is the kind of photograph and video that we look at to see what the structures of the knee. And we look at it obviously much better than an x-ray. But this allows us to look at the structures, understand the pathology, and treat the pathology. Then we have the ankle, which involves the distal tibia and the distal fibula, as well as the talus. The ankle joint is a particularly challenging joint because of all the forces we put around. Think about when you run, when you take a step, climb stairs, climb a ladder, all the forces that go through this relatively tiny joint, okay? This is the lateral aspect of the ankle. Here's the fibula, the little bone on the outside of the leg, and here's the tibia. The tibia bears about 90% of the weight on each one. People have said that when you take a step, you are putting six times your body weight across the knee. When you run, you're putting 20 times your body weight across your knee. So if you are a felt 150 pound individual and you're jogging, the forces across your knee 
are on the order of a thousand pounds per square inch. That's a lot. That's the kind of insult and abuse that those joints take. And in the short term, they do well. Long term, they, they tend to wear out. Down here, we have the calcaneus. And the calcaneus, the heel bone, is a very big structure because it takes all that force when you take a step. And that's why when you have running shoes, you've got a lot of padding down there to minimize this thing. But you can fracture this bone and it becomes really problematic. Through here, you can see the arch of the foot. Everybody should have a normal arch. However, there are those of us who are flat-footed. There is no arch and it compromises the ability of these bones to, to deal with different things. Real quickly, I wanna mention this one joint right here. These are the metatarsals and these are carpal bones. Right through here is called the Lisfranc joint. And the Lisfranc joint is subtle, but it's a particularly difficult joint to treat, particularly if there was a fracture through the joint or a disruption of the ligaments. So if you see the word Lisfranc, L-I-S-F-R-A-N-C on the documentation, that should be a big red flag. This could be very, very problematic. Not through any fault of anybody's own, but if you have that injury, it's just very difficult to treat. When we talk about the muscles of the lower extremity, again, like the hand, the musculature is up in the distal aspect of the leg. So we've got the longest muscle here and it attaches to all these tendons. And these tendons cause your foot to dorsal flex your toes. Excuse me for a second. It's a little going on here, I apologize. Um, cause you to dorsal flex your toes. And here is the Achilles tendon back here and the other tendons everting your foot. I wanna point out the ligaments here and you've got ligaments between all these bones keeping the ankle stable. So that when you get an ankle sprain, again, we'll talk about this from frame, these ligaments are torn, either first degree, second degree, or third degree. And again, if it's a third degree here and less force here, these could be torn as well. Not all ankle sprains require surgical intervention. However, some do, but there needs to be very specific objective data on MRI demonstrating the need for that surgery. There are some providers who are willing to go to surgery in a heartbeat. Other providers say, yeah, let's the body heal itself. Let's treat it conservatively. The surgery itself is rather straightforward, but the success rate isn't what we'd like it to be. And of course, here are the bones of the foot to include the fibula tibia we talked about, the calcaneus. And of course, you got the cuneiforms here, the metatarsal, the long bones here, and phalanges. And they're the phalanges are tiny. Uh, they curl up, they do a lot of different things, um, and you break your toe and, you, and go for it. Interesting to note that you can, if you had an injury to the great toe, that is a 1% impairment rating, but all the other ones really don't add to the impairment rating at all. And they tend to heal pretty well. A severe ankle sprain, and we all see the ankle sprains, and we had some cases about that uh, going forward. Uh, and I just wanted to show you a severe ankle sprain. Look how this is swelling here. And the purple discoloration, the sprain was so severe, not only did it tear the ligaments, it also tore the blood vessels. And you had bleeding in the foot and the bleeding distracted, di tracked distally, collecting by the toes. So when you have bleeding here and bleeding down in the calcaneus with this amount of swelling, that would indicate a severe ankle sprain. And that can be somewhat problematic in the long term. So we talked about the upper extremity and the lower extremity. Let's talk about our friend, the spine. We have the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, the lumbar spine. Every part of the spine contains vertebra, discs, nerve roots, and musculature. It's very crucial for you to understand exactly what level we're talking about, how that level correlates to the mechanism of injury, and how the findings on physical examination correlate to the reported pathology. In the cervical spine, most of the time there are seven vertebral bodies, sometimes there are eight. The first one is called C1, that's called the axis, and the second one is called C2, that's the axis. The atlas holds the weight of the head and the axis is where the motion occurs. So if you have a fracture of C2 at the axis, that's also known as hangman's fracture. If you were to get the noose, and I wouldn't, we don't use that very often anymore, but if you were to get the noose and they hang you, you break it there, you break and then uh, the impulses to the, Greater compromise because you 
you've taken out the uh, spinal cord and therefore your uh, borto. So, and then we've got the nerve roots. And the nerve roots are named for the disc, uh, the material body above it. As we can see here, here's the atlas. Here's a C1 vertebral body and the C1 nerve root is above it, okay? Similar, here's C2 and here's the nerve root again above it. And again, if it's a C2 slash C3 disc lesion, and we can see the disc right here, it's a C3 nerve root, nerve root radiculopathy, radiculitis, whatever the case may be. Whereas the C2, C3 disc is here, and this is the C2 disc. So the nerve roots are named from above, the discs are named from the, the, the space below. So between C2 and C3 is a C2 disc. Most often you'll see the radiologist reported as the disc at the C2 slash C3 interspace because there's so much confusion about the naming convention. But again, you need to know what the injury is, what the pathology is, where the symptoms are, and the findings on physical examination, and then correlate them to the pathology on MRI to see that. If you've got somebody who's got a C4 nerve root lesion, but their findings are in their thumb, which is a C7, C6 uh, nerve root distribution, then you say, yeah, true, true, and unrelated. So this is why we need to know the anatomy to sort out what, what symptoms are being presented, what findings on physical examination, and how that correlates with the findings noted on MRI. And here's just a, a little bit better picture of the cervical spine from the lateral perspective. And you can see there's pedicles that go off posteriorly and you really can't appreciate the lateral, the lateral processes here. But at each of these levels, at each, at each of these gaps that you see here, this is where the nerve roots play. When those gaps are compromised, either by spondylosis, facet joint disease, or a disc lesion, and that space is compromised, that's when you get radiculopathy of that nerve root. Similar to what we talked about with the median nerve, when that space is compromised and decreased and the median nerve is not functioning, it happens here. If the cervical nerve root has a wonderful place to play, as we can see here, this eight millimeters right through here, they're happy. But when this eight millimeters becomes two millimeters and we get a foraminal stenosis because the space is decreased, then you get a nerve root compromise and people talk about surgical intervention or a fusion and there's different philosophies about what particular surgery is appropriate. And it, there's a whole discussion about that separate talk. In the thoracic spine, we have 12 vertebral bodies. As you can see, the whole spine has two curves. And this is what's called a ventral curve. And as the Romans have learned that a curved structure can hold more weight. When you see the, the old stone bridges back in from the Roman era, they have curvature and can hold more weight than a straight across bridge. That's just a fact of life. But a normal curvature is demonstrated here. And if it's an increased curve, for some reason it goes from here to over here, that's called a kyphosis. There are a number of reasons for a kyphosis. You could have a fracture of this vertebral body. And of course, this space is not four millimeters. It becomes one millimeter because of the fracture and this space becomes decreased. So all of a sudden, instead of having this gentle curve, it's a much more severe angle in this direction. Excuse me, and that's, and that's a kyphosis. The spine normally is straight. However, we've all heard when a spine gets curved, that's called a scoliosis. So when you hear scoliosis, it's in a lateral deviation. And if you hear kyphosis, it's an anterior posterior deviation. And the severity is how you treat that. Severe scoliosis can be, require what's called Harrington rods. And they'll put a little rod down here, all the way up to here, and they crank it up to straighten out the spine. It sounds barbaric, and to a certain extent it is, but that's the treatment necessary to address that. So if you hire, if, if you have an employee with a history of scoliosis and a fusion or a surgery to address that scoliosis, their back is not gonna be happy to begin with. It's not the original anatomy, it's been compromised and they're gonna be at risk for a significant additional uh, injury and, and disease process. And here are the nerve roots. Again, here's the brain, here's the spinal cord. At each level, these nerve roots go off to different areas. What you're not gonna see here is a radiculopathy because here these nerve roots go to the upper extremity and the spine, they go to the lower extremity and they compromise the functionality 
in the distal upper extremity or the distal lower extremity. So you very rarely get a radiculopathy in the thoracic spine. You may get a nerve root compromise secondary to a disc herniation, but that's not truly a radiculopathy if there's no motor loss or sensory loss. And of course, the lumbar spine. 50% of all injuries occur to the lumbar spine. There's five vertebral bodies to include the sacrum. Each has nerve roots and discs as we talk about. And again, because the body itself puts so much stress through the lumbar spine, the bones are much thicker. Remember when we went back to the axis, it was a very thin vertebral body. It only has to hold up 22 pounds of your head. Down here, you've got the L4 and L5 vertebral bodies, and they got to hold up hundreds of pounds. And of course, the body responds to that by making them very, very thick. In addition, because of the stressors in a lot of different planes, the body recognizes that and look at all the construction. You've got the anterior longitudinal ligament, the posterior longitudinal ligament, you really can't see that. You, you've got a capsule ligament or the facet joint, you've got an interspinous ligament, you've got a transverse ligament over here, and of course, in the back between the, uh, uh, the posterior uh, elements, you've got the ligamentum flavum. All these ligaments prevent a sprain. All these ligaments prevent translation of the vertebral bodies. If we didn't have these ligaments, we would be down there with jellyfish, okay? Everything is moving around. So when you see these reports that say, oh, he's got a sprain of L2, L3, L4, L5, and all these ligaments are disrupted, if that were true, I want you to remember this slide and know that, yeah, no, dude, not happening. You cannot sprain, cannot compromise all those ligaments at one time and still be walking around. Additionally, you know, you might get an interstitial thing, but before you accept a diagnosis of a lumbar sprain, remember this slide and it probably didn't happen. The concept of a lumbar sprain slash strain diagnosis is what I believe to be a, what we call a garbage can diagnosis. It's overly broad, not very genetic. It's just, ah, he hurt his back, lumbar sprain slash strain, throw some uh, knots and riddles and PT at him and then out of here. The guy's been a little bit lazy, okay? In addition, you've got this structure back here, the ligamentum flavum. They very, because of the spine moves, okay? As we talked about in our last talk, it moves right here at the facet joints. Because the spine moves and it become, these little tiny fibers can be compromised and they heal in terms of scarring, you get what's called ligamentum flavum hypertrophy. And that hypertrophy compromises the space. As you can see, there's a, you get a sense of a little space here. At this level, there's no more spinal cord. But at each level, the spinal nerve roots come down under each pedicle and they dropped up. So you got a thickened ligamentum flavum tempered by a, a disc bulging. One plus one equals three. And you've got a compromise of the nerve root at this level. Again, these are degenerative changes. You do not get an acute ligamentum flavum hypertrophy, okay? Now, if you had an acute disc lesion in the face of a ligamentum flavum hypertrophy, that become problematic. And that, uh, to address that requires different interventions, but make sure you're not dealing with pathology that is yours. Again, I wanted to point out the vertebral bodies, there's a little bit of a lordata curve. And if somebody had, and back here to the right of this slide, this is where all the musculature is, the paravertebral musculature. And if you got muscle spasm, which could occur, I'm not saying that doesn't happen, the muscle spasms tighten up and it causes a compromise to the normal lordotic curve. So if the radiologist says there's a loss of lordosis, instead of being a curve, this is straight. And that is not as efficacious as a normal lordotic curve. Okay, but again, let's point out the spaces here. These are the foramen at each of these levels, and this is when the nerve root exits. Okay, and you can see the facet joints. And the facet joints are happy, they're articulating, there's space here. As you can see over here, here's where the nerve roots come out. Everybody's happy, yay, good. Okay, if this nerve root goes out here and it's the L4 nerve root, it's gonna innervate the lateral aspect of the distal lower extremity, yay. I wanna point out real here, notice right here, this little branch. This little branch of the nerve root innervates the facet joint right through here. So if I've got severe arthritis of the facet joint, I'm going to block the nerve, the pain impulses at this level. And while the pathology is still there, you don't have pain. Good. It's kind of like anesthesia. 
if you think about it, when they take you to the operating room, they're going to cut you. And you're going to be cut and feel it if you're on the street or in the operating room. The difference is we give you chemicals in the form of anesthesia and the pain fibers of pain impulses don't get to your brain. Therefore, we can operate without you jumping all over the place. I can tell you that in some situations, I've, I've seen it where they try to do a quote unquote light anesthesia and you're doing something, the patient's moving, it's really difficult to operate on a moving patient, personal experience. So the anesthesia will give them more drug or put them in a deeper sleep, whatever. And, and that's, that's the purpose of anesthesia. But anesthesia simply blocks the brain's ability to receive pain impulses. It doesn't stop the pain, but it, you, you just don't know it. It's like when you go get it, if you got a laceration and they put some lidocaine into the, the wound, we're still sewing, sewing you up and the pain fibers are there, but the chemical transmission of those pain fibers through the nerves is not happening. So you don't feel pain. We can do our suturing and you're good to go. And again, between each of the vertebral bodies is the disc. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. I apologize. The nerve roots at each level, you've got the nerve roots coming off, going to different parts of the body. And I can tell you by a competent, thorough, accurate physical examination, if there is a specific nerve compromise, I can know from the physical examination. At one level, you get the, uh, they come together and this becomes a sacral plexus. And again, they divide out. But because of these different nerve roots, I know that this is the, uh, for, here's the fifth lumbar nerve root, okay? That innervates the, uh, the motor function to the eccentric house as long as if I'm examining you and I ask you to pull your big toe up towards your face and I'm holding it down with resistance and there's no motion, I say, oh, he's not moving his big toe. That tells me there's an L5 nerve root problem. As opposed to if they can, you can pull it up and I can't pull it down, you've got good strength, then there's no L5 nerve root problem or radiculopathy. And that's why we go through these things. like raise your toes, lower your feet, stand on your toes, stand on your heels. All those little different tests that we do are to establish where there is pathology relative to the anatomy of the lumbar spine. Earlier, we talked about the facet joints. Remember, this is where all the motion occurs at the facet joints. There's a gap here, there's a space here, but here's where the motion and the articulation occurs. This is kind of blown apart a little bit, normal healthy joint, but with time, they wear out. And as you can see this drawing, look how it's red, it's inflamed, it's narrowed. It's got little knobby things. That's an arthritic facet joint. If you have arthritis in the facet joints, it's like arthritis in your knee, arthritis in your hip, arthritis in your elbow. It hurts. Think of arthritis as rubbing sandpaper on sandpaper. It doesn't glide. It's not smooth. The chondral surface has gone away. It's not a happy camper. So that's why we have facet joint pain, and we want to really differentiate between back pain, back pain secondary to a facet joint or secondary to a nerve root lesion or a disc lesion. The treatment plan is different. This pathology clearly is not yours. So if you've got a pain management guy saying, well, we've ruled out disc herniation because his EMG is normal and his physical examination is normal, but he's got facet joint disease, raise the red flag, P on 11, facet joint pathology is not yours unless there was an acute fracture, which can occur, but is relatively rare. What is more common is arthritis. And if it's arthritis, it's not yours. Particularly when we talk about this part of the spine, more often, what's the mechanism of injury? He was lifting up a can of Coke that fell to the floor. Then he's got a muscle spasm, and we shouldn't be treating the facet joint disease with injections and other ablation pr protocols. We should be treating the muscles with physical therapy and other topical protocols and not interventions and it clearly doesn't need a surgery. However, if there was a severe arthritis here and nothing did it, some people would argue that if I fuse these vertebral bodies together and there's no motion, that should take away the pain. In theory, that's correct and it does happen. However, when you fuse these two bodies right up here, so instead of having two chunks of bone, you've got one chunk of bone because you've got a posterior effusion and an anterior effusion, that changes the normal anatomy of the spine. And what happens is the lower levels will say, whoa, I got more forces coming through here as were the more proximal levels. And of course, you, see, you solve a problem here, but then you get problems above or below and you're just beginning to chase yourself. We, we had a case that 
the doctor was act, actually asking to fuse L1 to the sacrum. He wanted to take away all lumbar motion. This guy would not be able to sit, stand, or move without pain. You know, there's no indication for that. It's an, uh, an in play, it's a Hail Mary type procedure that just isn't going to work. You know, when the first fusion doesn't work, let's do a second fusion. Are you kidding me? We know there's providers out there who will do that. They'll say that it just doesn't make any clinical sense. And that is why if you look at the ODG in Texas, lumbar fusions and workers' comp are not certified. The complication rate is approaching 89%. I want to talk about the lumbar disc. So as we noted before, each vertebral body, nice and big, has compressive forces. And here's the lumbar disc. And the lumbar disc is a shock absorber between all these vertebral bodies, okay? And the lumbar disc has its tolerances. At some point, it goes south. It can be compromised. As you can see here, and this is where I use my jelly donut analogy. If you had a nice fresh strawberry jelly donut and you grabbed it between your thumb and fingers and you squeezed on it, the jelly comes out. And at different levels of the jelly coming out, it's the difference between a protrusion or a herniation or a sequestration. Here, as you can imagine, if this was the jelly donut and here's that strawberry jelly I was talking about, it escaped. I think you can appreciate right through here a rupture of the annulus, okay? And the nucleus propulsus has escaped and it's compromising the nerve root and the spinal cord here, right through here. And this is not the cord itself, but it's probably the nerve roots, okay? And they're compromised. You can see it's blackened and compromised. And instead of being straight, they kind of make a bend, all that. This compromise at this level will cause symptomology distal in the lower extremity, depending on the innervation involved. Different radiologists have different definitions for uh, the severity of a disc. Some call it degenerative disc disease. Look at it, it's got a jellies out a little bit. There's a little bit of a tear in the annulus, but it's intact. And this is a little problematic. There are some pain fibers in the annulus. There are no pain fibers in the nucleus propulsus. But here it's a much more severe escape. The annulus is still intact, but it's really bending out left to right, as you can see here. Okay, that's a prolapse. When the annulus protrudes, or I'm sorry, when the annulus is compromised and it protrudes out, that's called a disc extrusion or a herniation because it's come through the annular material. When it's so severe that the nuclear material is down the spinal canal, that's called a sequestration. Other people have different terminology, have different thresholds for causing a, calling it a protrusion or a herniation. There are some folks who call a two millimeter lesion a disc herniation because it fits the narrative of the surgeon and he wants to go do a two level surgery. You got to look at that. So when you're reading the MRI report, look at the severity of the disc lesion. Also, and I want to really emphasize this, if there is a two millimeter disc lesion at L2, L3, L3, L4, L4, L5 at multiple levels, that's an ordinary disease of life degenerative process. That is not an acute lesion. So yeah, we've got a five foot five inch, 250 pound individual who's got multiple of things. His back is just given out, it's tired. Dude, you should have lost hundred pounds 10 years ago. I can't take it anymore, but that's just it. That is not your pathology, okay? So look at the MRI report to, de to determine the severity. And if it's all relatively identical, one or two millimeters at each level, then you know it's a long-term degenerative process and not an acute lesion. And again, here we have a normal disc, happy foramen at L4, L5. Look at that nerve root. Happy guy doing its thing. However, you've got degenerative disc disease like disc desiccation. Desiccation means the water content of the disc has escaped. Again, long-term degenerative process. So instead of having this space up here, you got no space. And when you lose the space here at the, the ability for a shock absorber, it compromises the foramen back here, and this nerve becomes swollen, inflamed, and aka a pinched nerve or a, a bad back or whatever you want to call it. Okay, but again, it's a degenerative process. But there are ways we can look at the MRI report and really establish if it's your pathology. Can you get an acute disc herniation? And the answer is yes. No toys about it. You can do it. It can be the stupidest thing. I had a very good friend of mine 
who got out of the shower, bent over to dry his toes, and he blew out two discs. It dropped him like a bad habit, put him on the floor. His kid called me up. He was screaming. And I, I go over there. I had to help pick him up and get him off of, off of his bathroom floor and, into bed. Boom. And we, he had, the physician buddy of mine who was practice happened on an MRI scanner. So he got his MRI the same day. Wink, wink, nod, nod. And we know that. And when we showed the films to other certain, half of the guys wanted to operate right away. Other guys said, yeah, let's do a steroid injection. He elected for the epidural steroid injection. And six weeks later, he was playing golf again, no surgery. But you can get an acute disc herniation. You have to look at all the different parameters and understand the intent of the surgeon. Some guys want to cut really quickly. Some guys want to be more cautious. And it's really a combination of the two that is best practices. So we talked about the different parts of the body, the upper extremity, lower extremity, and the spine. Now let's talk about directions. And you need the four points of a compass. And this goes back to that first slide where I said, how we adjust them. We look at the human body forward and from there with our certain conventions that we've adopted. So flexion is a movement that decreases the angle between two body parts. So I have my arm fully extended and I flex my angle, my elbow, I should say, it goes from 180 degrees to 90 degrees. So I've decreased the angle between my upper arm, the humerus and my lower extreme, the radialis. That represents flexion and on every body part. The knee is the same thing, it flexes, uh, dorsal flexion, plantar flexion of the ankle. But if you think of flexion, it's reducing the angle as opposed to extension. An extension increases the angle. So if I have, I don't know if you can see this, my elbow is at 90 degrees right here, okay? Because I've got the splint on, I can't extend it. But if I try to extend it to 180 degrees, I'm, decre I'm increasing the angle from 90 to 180, and that's extension. Abduction. Abduction means away from the midline. So if I draw a line down my forehead, my nose to my belly button, that's the midline. And if I move away from that midline, either my leg or my arm or whatever, that's called abduction, as opposed to adduction. And that's, again, this is a, a very common typographical error. Everybody's using Dragon Dictator or some other form of voice recognition software, and they have a hard time picking up between abduction and adduction. So be, be careful what they're talking about. But for adduction, my arm is way out to the right and I bring it to my belly button and that's, I'm, I'm bringing it towards the midline, so I'm abducting my shoulder. Internal and external rotation, again, how I rotate the, the leg or the arm relative to the midline. Anterior, so anterior is the front part of the body. My belly button is on the anterior aspect of my abdomen, it's the front part of it as opposed to the gluteal fold, which is the back part of my body, and that's posterior, okay? So again, we're talking about ventral or dorsal. Now, when you get a structure like your hand, which rotates, what are we talking about? That becomes more confusing. So the anterior aspect or the palmar aspect is called ventral, and the posterior aspect is called dorsal. I use the concept of a dorsal fin on a fish to remind me what we're talking about. So I, if I hit the back of my hand with a hammer, I injure the dorsal aspect of my hand. If I hit my hammer on the palmer, that's the ventral or palmer aspect of my hand. And again, different structures are involved, different treatment or different things could happen and different treatments are rendered. We talked about ventral and, and dorsal, the front and the back. Proximal means closer to the head. So my proximal humerus is way close to my head as opposed to the distal humerus which uh, I'm sorry, that's a typographical error, which is away from my head. Okay, I didn't pick that up. I apologize. And spell checker obviously didn't catch that. So I have a humerus, the proximal aspect close to my head, the distal aspect is away from the head. Caudal. Caudal means going towards the head. Most commonly used in epidural steroid injections or a caudal in injection. They'll put the needle in the lower lumbar spine point the needle towards the head and squirt in the steroid. So I'm going caudally, I'm going towards the head. And that's the most common definition. And again, medial, we just talked about it, towards the midline and lateral is away from the midline. So I have the medial meniscus of the right knee is very close to the medial meniscus of the left knee where the lateral meniscus of the right knee is as far away from the lateral meniscus as the left knee as you can. So that's medial and lateral. 
and valgus and varus, okay? Basically, it flies to the knee. I have a valgus deformity or a varus deformity. If you look at the lower extremity and it's not really straight, but they're not knock knee. So I've got a bow-legged individual, that's a varus deformity. As you can see, it's a way, it's a bigger gap. There is a deformity on the medial aspect of both knees going away from the midline, as opposed to a valgus deformity or knock knee. Okay, the, the lateral aspects of the knee are compromised. It opens up and my knees are together. So this is what we call a varus and or valgus deformity. And here's a good, cute little picture. The knee on the left or the right knee, in this case, because of the uh, view, is a normal appearing knee. And they did the drawings and they're happy with it. Look at the knee on the, on the right side here. And you can see this white area. This is what we talked about as bony sclerosis, okay? The compartment, there is no, compare the two. This has a little bit of space. You can see a little bit of black here. Here, hardly any, okay? This is what we call bone on bone arthritis with a valgus deformity. And I can tell you from these little drawings here, they're teeing this guy up for total neoarthroplasty. Okay, they're gonna to try to straighten this out and give this guy a normal gait pattern. But here's a, a graphic example of a valgus deformity. There's a few procedures I want you to be aware of. Ectomy. Ectomy is a surgical removal of a structure. Appendectomy, they yanked out your appendix. Colectomy, they took out your whole colon. Vasectomy, I'm not going there. Osteotomy, osteotomy is a surgical alteration to a bone. So that if I go in there and I want to correct a calcaneal fracture or I want to sh shave off some osteophyte formation or things like that, if I'm altering the, any bone in any fashion surgically, that's called an osteotomy. Osteo meaning bone, otomy uh, meaning alteration. And oscopy, a visual examination. We talked about a knee arthroscopy. I'm looking into the joint, the knee joint with a direct scope. I can see it, yay. And we can do a scope into shoulders. You can actually do scopes into spines. They were doing that a few years ago, not so much anymore. Uh, ankles, other joints, people are looking at. It. In fact, there are some people who believe, and there are products out there where you can do a knee arthroscopy as an office procedure. Hook up your iPad to this device, you put the needle into the knee like you're doing an injection, and you can scope it out. Not, not endorsed to the ODG, but it's out there in, in case you do see it. Additional terms, palpation is using your hands to touch or feel. I'm gonna palpate the abdomen. Uh, he has tenders to palpation on the lateral aspect of his knee, things of that nature. Range of motion. Range of motion is the potential movement of a joint. And there's two types, active motion. And active motion is what the examinee can do. I can actively flex my uh, elbow 90 degrees. Okay, why can't you do more than that? And that's the question to be resolved. As opposed to passive range of motion is what the examiner does. Well, actively I flex my elbow to 90 degrees, but passively I can flex it to 140 degrees. Why can't I, what's the difference here? Why can't this guy not go that extra 50 degrees? Is he being less than genuine? Is there a, a neurologic issue? What's going on? That's the narrative report that has to explain the difference between active and passive. I bring that up because if you go back to the impairment rating on range of motion for the upper extremity, it's all based on active range of motion. So if I go there and say, oh, impairment rating, if I don't bend my elbow, I get a higher impairment rating and active flexion is 20 degrees. That's a huge impairment rating. If you think about it, I can only bend my elbow 20 degrees. With that, I couldn't use my right arm to drink a beer. Think about it, 20 degrees, I can't get close to the beer can. So therefore, you have to explain that the impairment rating provider has to explain what is the clinical basis for that active range of motion loss? If he doesn't do it, the impairment rating is not correct as for chapter two of the guides. And there's, I know I've thrown a lot at you and this, this talk will be on YouTube. And if you want a copy of the PowerPoint, Alex will be happy to send it to you to so just let her know, but there's things to remember. Injections are the best thing ever invented to feeding doctors. I, I, I can't tell you how many reports I've looked at in the last two weeks where everybody's getting an injection of a non-steroidal for pain control, okay? Keterolac, why? You know, everybody's getting, a, you know, I got severe pain, let's give them a Keterolac injection. And while it is indicated for pain, there has to be a real clinical reason 
other than, oh, I got pain. You know, you can't prove to me I'm sitting in front of you right now that my I got low back pain rated at 10 slash 10. Give me an injection. No. Okay, there has to be a reason. But it, a lot of people do a lot of injections because it's easy and well compensated. From a surgical perspective, a chance to cut is a chance to cure. I, I learned that 40 years ago. We're not going to make it. As a surgeon, I did orthopedic surgery as a PA. I'm not going to make it better by doing nothing. But if I cut them, I can make them better. That's the mentality. Or we heal with steel. And if in doubt, cut it out. These are several bond mods that my surgeon friends have related to me on a number of occasions. With that, I would tell you, if you're ever in the mood, there is a book. It's called House of God. You can get it on Amazon or whatever the book service is at like $8. But it is about a year in the life of an intern at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. And Boston's where I trained, so it's at my home. But it is a very funny book and very insightful. And it'll tell you a lot of things which kind of molds what doctors today go through and their mentality about certain things. But if you want a fun little read, House of God, I really recommend that one. And as always, I want to thank you. Uh, we do appreciate this is the, the, the final one of this series of lectures. We're going to repeat the series in the fall, and I'm adding a couple of more talks. They haven't finished them yet because putting these talks together is not the easiest thing to do. But I want to thank you for your participation and, and your attendance. If you have any friends who need their continuing education hours because they can't get it, I know a lot of the uh, organizations aren't having virtual, they're having virtual meetings, but not you know, in line meetings. But this is a nice way to get all the continuing education hours that you need. Please send them to Alex let it, or let me know, and we're happy to uh, get them to get up with that. But I want to really thank you for your participation over the last number of weeks. And again, send me a note anytime or call me. Or, or we have all the social media stuff, which I truly don't understand, but, uh, but it's there. And I'm happy to take your questions. I